And this is going to be very much in line um, with the talks we, we already heard from Guy and Omer and Cynthia on individual probabilities. And one of the points they hammered home in their talks is that individual probabilities, even if we buy that they exist, are, are sort of fundamentally unknowable. And what we're going to try to argue here is that while that's true, we can't know whether we've gotten down to the individual probabilities. You and I, if we agree on what the data is um, and we're talking to each other, we also cannot disagree about what they are. We must come to a consensus about what the individual probabilities are, even if we're possibly both wrong. Okay. Yeah. And let me click on this. Okay, so just to sort of remind you of individual probabilities, and this is sort of riffing on the introduction of this excellent paper by David that I think Cynthia has mentioned a few times. Um, in practice, in the practice of machine learning and statistics, we deal in individual probabilities all the time. We talk about the probability that it will rain tomorrow. We talk about the probability that Alice will die in the next 12 months if we're trying to price her life insurance. We talk about the probability that Bob will be arrested for a violent crime 18 months after release on parole, or the probability that Carol will develop breast cancer before the age of 50, and so on. And so what are these things, right? So you know, when we speak about them in a formal way, what we are talking about is objects that exist in a model of the world. We can choose to model the world as some distribution over feature outcome pairs. The you know, X here represents the things that I you know, can observe and measure about a person, for example. Y is the observed outcomes. And within a formal model, uh, I can coherently talk about individual probabilities. I can talk about the probability that the label will come out to be one conditional on everything I know about a person, conditional on features. This makes sense in the formal model. And, and so I want to just highlight that this is a modeling choice to model things with probability distributions. Um, I, I think it's often a fine and well-justified modeling choice in particular, as Cynthia and, and Guy have mentioned. You know, we're not committing to a random world. This modeling choice is consistent with a deterministic universe. But nevertheless, let me sort of flag here that this is a modeling choice. And once we fix this modeling choice, the basic problem with individual probabilities is that we cannot measure them because we observe each individual at most once. Uh, we have no way of measuring them statistically. In some sense, the only thing we have access to, the only thing we can measure are averages over sufficiently large sets, sufficiently large reference classes. So what is the outcome on average for people in some set S? And by and large, the more data we have, the smaller the sets S are such that we can estimate this quantity. So given this, what are we to make of individual probabilities? And in David's paper, he gives two ways of conceptualizing these probabilities in broad strokes. One he calls the group to individual conception and one the individual to group. And again, in broad strokes, in the group to individual perspective, the foundational objects are, are these averages over sets or averages over reference classes, because this is the thing we can measure. And so if I want to get at some individual probability X, then what I do is I somehow pick an appropriate reference class, some appropriate set of people S that X is a member of, and then maybe I go to data and I estimate the average prevalence of the outcome over this set S. And then maybe I say, okay, well, since X is a member of this set X, uh, S, X's individual probability is equal to the average prevalence I measured over this set S. And of course, the main problem with this conception is what is the right reference class? There might be many different reference classes, and this is known in the philosophy of science as the reference class problem. Okay, now the individual to group perspective, uh, which is going to be the most familiar to people who study statistics and, and uh, machine learning, posits that actually the foundational objects are the individual probabilities. This is what is central to probabilistic modeling. And of course, we don't know them. That's the main problem. Uh, but like once I commit to average, once I commit to individual probabilities, a model of individual probabilities commits me also to predictions about the average propensity of some outcome over any particular set, any particular reference class. And since for large reference classes, I can measure this, uh, the reference classes gives me, give me an empirical way to falsify models of, of individual probability. And, and the main problem here is that there can be 
multiple potentially very different models of individual probability that are consistent with the same set of observations. This is sometimes called the model multiplicity problem. Okay, so let me talk briefly about the reference class problem and the model multipli multiplicity problem. If you've read about the reference class problem, you've read about this court case, United States versus Shinobi, which is sort of a favorite example in this literature, but I think it's illustrative. So let me walk you through it. So Charles Shinobi was a 34 year old Nigerian citizen living in New Jersey, he worked as a toll booth operator. And he was caught at JFK with 103 balloons filled with heroin in his digestive tracts. And he was uh, brought to trial and convicted. Uh, now it was believed that he'd actually made eight other drug smuggling trips for which he hadn't been caught. They didn't know how much heroin he'd brought in those other trips. And yet the sentencing guidelines required the court to estimate the total quantity of heroin smuggled across all trips. And a property individual to him that had not been measured. And so the government statistician, Dr. David Boyum, uh, produced an estimate by collecting data and analyzing it from all Nigerian drug smugglers apprehended at JFK between the dates of Charles Shinobi's first and last trips. And so here, Nigerian drug smugglers apprehended at JFK is a reference class. But it's not the only one, as brought up by his defense attorneys. Um, you know, why was that the right one? We could have compared him to drug smugglers apprehended anywhere. Maybe being Nigerian wasn't the relevant thing. Maybe we should have compared him to drug smugglers living in New Jersey apprehended at JFK. Maybe the fact that he's a toll booth operator is relevant. Maybe we should compare him to toll booth operators. And because Shinobi was a member of all of these reference classes, and yet computing uh, the average amount of drugs smuggled per you know, trip to JFK from each of these reference classes would have given us a very different number. What is it that privileges one of these estimates over another? This is the reference class problem. Okay, now how about the model multiplicity problem? Well, in machine learning and statistics, when we train a probabilistic model, we commit to some model of individual probabilities. It's a, it's a function. We feed into it numbers or you know, we feed into it observations about potentially a person and the model outputs a number that perhaps purports to be a probability. Um, and, and again, the problem is since individual probabilities are unobserved, how do we adjudicate between different models? Now we could check for consistency. We could try to falsify these models with respect to a large number of reference classes. And multi-calibration says something about this. If we are multi-calibrated with respect to a collection of reference classes, that means that our model is consistent with the data as measured on all of those reference classes, meaning um, the data, you know, none of those reference classes as evaluated on the data falsify our model. But nevertheless, multi-calibration does not imply uniqueness. So I might have two different models, P1 and P2, that are both multi-calibrated with respect to the same set of reference classes. None of those reference classes falsify either model, and yet they might disagree wildly on many individual probabilities. And so the question again is, you know, how do we adjudicate between these two things? If we have two model, two, two ways of estimating individual probabilities that seem to agree with the data and yet disagree on your prediction, how am I justified in making a decision based on you, perhaps one of some import based on these probability estimates that don't seem uniquely fixed by the data. And so we could try to adjudicate differences with something else, maybe accuracy. So it turns out that the true individual probabilities minimize squared error. They sort of correspond to the most accurate model. So for example, you know, suppose I take some model of individual probabilities, I'll call B of, of P, uh, B stands for Breyer score, uh, the sort of evaluation of the squared error of that model. This can be accurately estimated from data. And the thing that's true is that the true individual probabilities have lower Breyer score than any other model of you know, any other model of individual probabilities. And so if we have two different models, P1 and P2, and P1 has lower Breyer score than B2, then this falsifies that you know, the hypothesis that P2 encoded the true individual probabilities. It cannot be. And so the model multiplicity problem says, okay, well, you know, what if I have two models that maybe are multi-calibrated with respect to the same uh, reference classes, all of the ones we can think of, and maybe they are equally accurate. They have the same Breyer score, and yet they're different models. Maybe it gives Alice a very different probability of the outcome. You know, maybe P1 gives Alice a very different probability than P2. 
you know, they're both, as far as we can tell, consistent with the data. What is it that privileges one of these predictions over another? And if the answer is there's nothing that privileges one of these predictions over another, how can we be justified in taking an action that might be really important to Alice based on one of these predictions? So that is the model multiplicity problem. And I would describe it as just a, another side of the coin of the reference class problem. The, you know, the, the reference class problem and the multi model multiplicity problem arise via different conceptions of individual probability, but in the end, um, they have the same bite, which is that we seem not to have a unique way of assigning an individual probability to a person. And if we don't have a unique way of doing it, then how, how do we say that one is the right one and the other one is not? Okay, so our contention is that although it's true that individual probabilities are unknowable, Right? Uh, you know, as, as Guy and Cynthia and Omer already explained to us, we can't even distinguish a world in which weather is unpredictable. It really is a coin flip every day from a world in which it's perfectly predictable, you know, it's deterministic just from, a, from an unknown mechanism. Right? So, so we really cannot solve the problem. We cannot know what individual probabilities really are. Two people who agree on what the data is, right? they might have deeper disagreements about you know, what is the right data to measure. But, but two people who agree on what the data is, or at least on how to sample from the data distribution, cannot agree to disagree on many individual probabilities. And, and so in some sense, the model multiplicity problem cannot arise in any practical sense. Okay, so I apologize in the rest of the talk, there's gonna be some notation, but I'm gonna pronounce it all in English. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a fluent speaker in notation, this is for you, but if you're not a fluent speaker, just listen to me. You don't have to look at the symbols on the slides. So suppose I have two models of individual probabilities. Let's say that those two models have an epsilon disagreement on some point, on some person. If they predict that the individual probability for that person, um, are, you know, if they predict two different numbers that are substantially different, that differ by more than epsilon. And Given these two models, I can talk about the set of people on whom these two models have an epsilon disagreement, the disagreement region of these two probability models. It's just the people, the, the individuals, for whom these two models predict probabilities, individual probabilities that differ substantially by more than epsilon. And I can split this disagreement region into two sets the set of people for whom the first model predicts a higher individual probability and the set of people for whom the second model predicts a higher individual probability. And the special thing about these two sets is that once I fix these two models, these are well-defined reference classes, I can easily tell uh, if a person is or is not in each of these reference classes. And by construction, the two models disagree not just about individual probabilities for members of these sets, but they disagree on what the outcome is going to be on average over these sets. And they disagree about this by a substantial amount, by more than epsilon. And so here's the idea. If we've got two models that don't have very many epsilon disagreements, then great. We essentially agree on the individual probabilities up to, up to small terms. But if our two models do have lots of epsilon disagreements. They, they disagree on the individual probabilities substantially for different people. Then it's got to be that there's a reference class that we have explicit access to. We can explicitly construct, there's only two things to try, that has the property that both this reference class is large. There's a lot of people in this reference class. And the two models disagree substantially on this reference class, not just on individuals, but also on average. And because the reference class is large, well, we can estimate accurately from data, what is the actual uh, propensity of the outcome uh, on this reference class? We don't, have to, we don't have to estimate individual probabilities. We can just estimate the average outcome over this reference class. We can do that from data because it's large. And because once we know this number, once we know the actual propensity of the outcome over this reference class, and the two models disagree about what this number should be, we must have falsified at least one of the models. We found a reference class such that for at least one of the models, there's large average disagreement. And once we falsify a model in this way, we can improve it in exactly the same way that multi-calibration algorithms uh, improve on, on subgroups 
that they're supposed to be multi-calibrated with respect to. It's actually extremely simple. Let's call delta the actual difference between you know, the actual propensity of the outcome on this reference class and what our bad, our now falsified model predicts that should have been. Well, here's the new model. For any person who's not a member of the reference class, we'll predict what the model already predicted in the past. And for every person who is a member of that reference class, we'll predict what the model predicted in the past plus delta. We'll, we'll shift it to sort of fix this, this error that we found. And not only have we sort of corrected the error we found on this reference class, it's easy to show that by fixing things in this way, we've actually improved the accuracy of the model. In fact, the squared error has gone down by, by a noticeable amount. And if all of the parties agree on the data, or at least the distribution, then all of the parties will agree that this new model is a better model than the old one in at least two senses. First, we've explicitly falsified the old model by exhibiting a reference class that it predicts wrongly on. And we've fixed the new model that, so that it's no longer falsified. And second, the new model is more accurate than the old model. It's more faithful to the true probabilities. Remember, the true probabilities are what minimize the Breyer score. And now we've got a new model. And if the two, you know, if, if my old model and your new model still don't agree almost everywhere, we can repeat. And so you can combine this, you can combine this sort of um, falsification and updating of, of these two models into an algorithm that we call a reconciliation process. And I, I don't want to dwell on the details of the algorithm, but I'm flashing it on the screen so you can see that it's, you know, simple and, and well-defined. And here's the, here's the upshot. Any two models of individual probabilities can be fed through this reconciliation process. And in a reasonably small number of rounds, the reconciliation process will produce two new models. And these two new models will have the following properties. First, the new models will be better models than the old models. And when I say better models, I mean not just that they have lower error than the old models, they will have lower error than the old models, but also that the old models will have been concretely falsified by the data, by reference classes we've, we've explicitly identified that do not falsify the new models. And these new models will agree almost everywhere on individual probabilities, meaning for at most an alpha, you know, for all but an alpha fraction of people, the two new models will predict individual probabilities that agree up to epsilon. And it's efficient and constructive computationally, but also in terms of data, right? We, we don't need much data. We don't need the sort of unreasonable amounts of data you would need to learn individual probabilities. In fact, we don't need data that grows with the complexity of these models at all. And the quantitative degree of disagreement can be quickly driven to zero with more data. OK, so in my last two minutes, some discussion. So our claim is that if participants agree on the data, or at least the process for sampling from the data distribution, and I'll flag that this is a big if, then severe versions of the model multiplicity problem cannot arise. Because if we have two equally accurate models that have many large disagreements, uh, neither of them are the best model. Both of them can be constructively supplanted with better models. And this process ends only when they almost agree almost everywhere. And although individual probabilities are in principle unknowable, we can't even distinguish a deterministic world from a random one. What I claim is they are contestable. If I propose a model for individual probabilities and you don't agree with it, you think I'm wrong, then what you can do is propose your own different model for individual probabilities. And there's a reconciliation process we can go through such that at each step of the process, we will both agree that the next model is better than the previous one. And this process will end quickly at a point where my model and your model do agree almost everywhere. So we can't know what individual probabilities are, but, but we can contest them. And these contestations can always be resolved from the data. And so maybe the, the, um, the punchline, the, the sort of maybe too uh, glib summary is that we cannot agree to disagree about individual probabilities. So, you know, we might both be wrong about them, but we can't disagree about them. At least any disagreement must be attributed to a more foundational disagreement about what the data is or, or whether it is even sensible to model the world with a probability distribution. And it's been 20 minutes, and so let me end there.